Sorry, there was just a slight miscommunication between Chase and myself. I am answering questions, but I think they're from probably, well, some of them actually are from yesterday and some the day before. So there seems to be two envelopes, and I'm getting one of them, but not the other. So one seems to come to me, and one seems to go to whoever is leading it. Uh, so I'll answer the questions I got in the envelope yesterday, but not the ones that Chase brought me this morning. Uh, I'll deal with them uh, tomorrow. So picking up again on Mark's question yesterday regarding John 5, and the statement that whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. John 5, 24. I revised my Greek alphabet overnight. <laughs> and it turns out Mark is absolutely correct, as you would expect. The word used in that passage is chrysis rather than krima. However, my point still stands. <laughs> According to B-D-A-G, Christus has the same semantic range and thus can mean condemnation rather than judgment in the sense of the judicial process. I think the final clause in that verse makes it clear that that's what is in view here. There'll be no condemnation. In any case, there's an abundance of texts in the New Testament that make it very, very clear that Christians will be present and will be judged at the final judgment. And it's always a good idea to interpret what appears to be difficult statements in the scripture in the light of those that are abundantly clear. Question then. A number of questions uh, relating to the issue of salvation and works. I'll not repeat the questions. I'll just try to mesh them all together. Uh, what about those who die in infancy? How do we discern genuine works of faith and do so without being overly introspective? So let me clarify I'm not suggesting that Christians should be introspective at all. I'm suggesting that true faith always manifests itself in our lives, i.e. by the fruit of the Spirit rather than the works of the flesh. If our lives are characterized by the latter, the works of the flesh, we're certainly not walking by the Spirit. And the Apostle Paul suggests that such people will not, will not inherit the kingdom of God. God's grace is transformative. And that will be evident to everyone on the last day. Faith expresses itself through love. Otherwise, such faith is dead and useless. However, we do not need to keep some kind of spiritual diary each day to monitor the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. And we certainly should not be thinking in terms of doing good works, even by the aid of God's Spirit, in order to make the grade, as it were. Good works should naturally flow from regenerated hearts. But they do not save us, nor are they the basis for our Christian assurance. The basis for both salvation and assurance is Jesus. We used to sing a course at Youth Fellowship. There's nothing more that we can do, for Jesus did it all, and we are complete in him. And I think that about sums it all up. <laughs> But on the last day, how we have lived will manifest the orientation of our lives and the motivation of our hearts. That is to say, it will reveal the true nature of the faith that we have professed. To be assured of a righteous verdict now and on the last day, we trust totally in Jesus. We trust totally in Jesus. And if we genuinely do that, we will live accordingly. That's the point I'm trying to make. In terms of infants, and I think I'd include many of those with Down syndrome and the like in this same category, I assume that they're all covered by the atoning death of Jesus. So they're elect. Uh, will our resurrection bodies be gendered or androgynous? I've rephrased the question. I'm not going to repeat the question the way it was asked. <laughs> I'm not sure if it was meant to be taken seriously or not, but I'm taking it seriously. Um, I assume that the risen Jesus was male, i.e., while his resurrection body was an upgrade from his mortal body, I don't think it was that different. Therefore, I assume that the same will apply to us also. I'm now kind of dreading question time tomorrow. <laughs> the answer to many of the more speculative questions you'll be tempted to ask about heaven is simply this, we don't know. Last question, I think. I think it's a joke, but I'll, ask, I'll use it anyway. Will my cat Gonzo be raised? 
I'm sorry if this is not the answer you want to hear, but I very much doubt it. <laughs> I don't think he, nor all those prehistoric dinosaurs, will be in heaven either. But I might be wrong. <laughs> you were looking forward to having your own pet Tyrannosaurus. <laughs> Okay, now let's get serious. <clears throat> Some have described it as the ultimate horror of God's universe, the dark side of the far hereafter, an eternal torture chamber. Dante's Inferno offers one of the most graphic portrayals imaginable. It's rivaled only perhaps by Greco-Roman images of Tartarus from which he drew some of his inspiration. Most of us naturally recoil from such barbaric and distasteful images. Indeed, few defenders of the traditional concept of hell still take the biblical images at face value, i.e. literally. But exactly how should we understand this dreadful place? Should we construe the biblical hell as the ultimate holocaust? As most of us are aware, hell has become a battlefield in recent decades. The debate, of course, goes back centuries, but it's now become an in-house dispute among friends. It's not between those who take scripture seriously and those who don't. Rather, it's between people who all submit to the authority of scripture and who all affirm the reality of hell. What they disagree on is the nature of hell, not the fact. Currently, three main views are espoused by evangelicals. Traditionally, hell has been understood as eternal conscious punishment, or eternal conscious torment. Since the 1970s, however, a very different understanding is increasingly popular. It was around before the 1970s, but among evangelicals, it has become increasingly popular since then. Often referred to as conditionalism or annihilationism, this views hell as terminal rather than eternal. It involves finite punishment, but with everlasting effects. Sooner rather than later, the lost simply cease to exist. So they will be, in every sense, terminated. More recently, a third alternative has been suggested, the idea that conscious punishment in hell is temporary rather than eternal. But more on that approach tomorrow. Today, our primary concern is with the first two views, whether the biblical hell is never-ending conscious punishment or is terminal judgment resulting in annihilation. As throughout this lecture series, our primary focus will not be on the theological case that proponents of either view can mount, but rather on the more foundational question, what does the Bible say? And what light might Second Temple Judaism shed on this? We'll begin, therefore, by considering the fate of the wicked in the Old Testament. The general consensus is that the Old Testament has little, if anything, to say about personal or individual eschatology. The focus is more on God's plan for Israel and the nations rather than what's going to happen to the individual. This is arguably true in relation to the righteous as well as the wicked. The former will be blessed and the latter will experience God's wrath. But such blessing or wrath is often bound up with the fate of the nation and is generally confined to what happens in the here and now. Little attention is given to what happens to individuals after they die or in the age to come. And for the most part, the Old Testament is more concerned with the living than with the dead. That being so, it may seem a strange place to go in search of a biblical theology of hell. However, not everyone agrees that the Old Testament is such unfruitful territory in this respect. Indeed, as we will see, those who defend a terminal view of hell find much in the Old Testament to support their argument. So I guess a lot depends on what you're looking for. If it's anything like Dante's Inferno, we'll probably be disappointed. 
for that kind of thing, we have to look elsewhere. But if we're simply looking for some conceptual background for New Testament teaching on hell, then the Old Testament may indeed be more fertile soil. The most obvious place to start is with the question of Sheol. After all, this is the Hebrew word that was traditionally translated as hell 31 times in the King James Version, and which is often associated with the wicked in the Old Testament. Indeed, according to some, this is perhaps the closest the Old Testament actually gets to describing the post-mortem fate of those under God's judgment. For most scholars, Sheol simply denotes the realm of the dead, a place to which everyone descends at death, regardless of their spiritual status. Indeed, some even understand Sheol to refer mainly to the grave. You'll see this reflected in your NIV. Such could be inferred from its underground location and its association with worms, maggots, and dust. But whether as a metaphor for the grave or as a term for the Hebrew underworld, most consider Sheol to be nothing more than the location of the dead. It's not somewhere to which only the wicked are consigned, and it's certainly not a place of ongoing punishment or everlasting torment. Rather, the only connotation of punishment that might be attached to Sheol lies in its association with death, the divinely decreed punishment for human sin. For Philip Johnson, however, this consensus ignores the fact that Sheol is portrayed predominantly as the fate of the wicked. While considering that it's occasionally anticipated by the righteous, Johnson notes that this is consistently during times of personal extremity, that is, when they're facing circumstances that they associate with the divine judgment. Job would be a classic example. Johnson further observes that in the case of Jacob, once the trying circumstances have dissipated, there's no further talk of Sheol. While Jacob anticipates his death using various motifs, Sheol is conspicuously absent. Thus, for a few scholars, rather than a kind of neutral abode for all the dead, Sheol does have more sinister undertones. Thus, like the New Testament hell, it is a place the righteous are keen to avoid at all costs. One doesn't like disagreeing with one's teachers, but uh, Philip Johnson was my Old Testament professor. Uh, I'm now going to disagree with him. Uh, I hope he's not tuned in. <laughs> the main difficulty with this view, however, is that in at least two places, Sheol is unambiguously spoken of as the post-mortem fate of everyone. Psalm 89, verse 48. What man can live and never see death? Who can deliver his soul from the power of Sheol? Rhetorical question, clearly the answer is no one. Ecclesiastes 9, verse 10. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, for there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol to which you are going. Uh, Johnson's attempt to explain Psalm 89, verse 48, in terms of humanity, sinful, and under judgment, and Ecclesiastes 9, verse 10, in terms of the absurdity of obser observable life, seems only to go some way towards resolving the problem. As I've said, the rhetorical question of Psalm 89, verse 48, still seems to imply that Sheol is the inevitable destiny for everyone, including the psalmist himself. Moreover, the prospect of divine judgment mentioned at the end of Ecclesiastes does not necessarily qualify Kohalat's suggestion that everyone goes to Sheol in the meantime. It may seem reasonable, therefore, to conclude that while the prospect of going there is certainly never welcomed, Sheol is nevertheless the unavoidable destiny for all humanity, regardless of their spiritual status. In terms of the righteous not wishing to go there, or expressing thanks for deliverance from Sheol. This can be explained simply in terms of premature death, i.e. the prospect of going to Sheol sooner than expected. The negative vibes and the focus on the wicked in particular is most likely due to Sheol's close association with death as God's punishment for sin, something that the wicked 
even with all the earthly security in the world, simply cannot avoid. That, I take it, is the main point in both Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 32. Here, each prophet takes us into the realms of Sheol, a little like Dante's tour of hell in the Divine Comedy. The imagery is very graphic. Isaiah envisions the demise of the king of Babylon and his arrival in Sheol. There are those who preceded him are roused to greet him with the statement, well, fancy meeting you here. Well, that's a paraphrase, you'll understand. <laughs> what they actually say is on the screen. I'll let you read it as I take a drink. You need to be quick. <clears throat> These verses are dripping with satire. The deceased kings of the earth rise from their thrones to welcome this newest arrival. Now he, with all his pomp, lies mouldering in the grave. For all his, splendor, for all his former splendor, he's now in Sheol with the rest of them. Ezekiel paints a, a similar picture with respect to the hordes of Egypt and mighty Pharaoh. Both will go down to the pit. From within Sheol, the mighty leaders will do a head count of Egypt and all her allies. Assyria, tick. Elam, tick. Meshach and Tubal, tick. Edom, tick. All the princes of the north and all the Sidonians, tick. Pharaoh and all his army, tick. United in life by the terror that they imposed on others, now united in Sheol by the king of terrors. Everyone is present and accounted for in this vast subterranean mausoleum. All are consigned to their respective quarters. But any notion of hierarchy or consolation in this text or in these texts is satirical. None of the imagery is intended literally. This includes what Ellis dismissively refers to as metaphorical and symbolic scenes of conversation among the maggots. We need to see through the imagery here to the actual point the text is making. What we have in all these graphic depictions is the image of Sheol as the great leveler. Doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter how powerful you are in this life, sooner or later everyone finds their way to this dark and gloomy place. However, while the Old Testament Sheol was apparently the destiny for all, there's little doubt that during the intertestamental period, the concept evolved significantly. This is reflected in the compartmentalization of Sheol and Hades that we see reflected in some of this literature, and which by the time of Jesus seems to have evolved into the idea that Hades, the lower region of Sheol, was restricted to the unrighteous dead. The Old Testament's portrayal of Sheol bears little resemblance, however, to the New Testament concept of hell. It does not seem to be the exclusive domain of the wicked, nor is there any suggestion of torment or any additional punishment in Sheol. The only, of, the only association of Sheol with punishment, as I've said, is its obvious links with death itself. Of course, some extrapolate from this that death and what it entails, i.e. exclusion from life and blessing, is the only final punishment that the Old Testament perceives. So it's important to consider how the fate of the wicked is portrayed in the Old Testament and what we can infer from this. Those who advocate a, a terminal view of hell point out that key vocabulary and imagery associated with the fate of the lost in the New Testament is explicitly associated with numerous divine judgments in Old Testament narratives. And these judgments involve nothing other than physical death and destruction. They further note that cataclysmic judgments such as the flood, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, these are subsequently used as a kind of model or, or template for later outpourings of God's wrath. And they all become symbols for the final destruction of the ungodly anticipated in the New Testament. While these observations are undeniable, there is a major problem with equating an Old Testament type with its New Testament anti-type in this manner. What a biblical type foreshadows normally surpasses or transcends the type itself. 
For instance, in the Old Testament, atonement is secured through the sacrificial death of an unblemished animal. However, as Hebrews tells us quite clearly, the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. Rather, as we all well know, it's the sacrificial death of the antitype, the blood of the lamb foreshadowed by these types, which atones for human sin. To equate the Old Testament death of rams or bulls or goats with the New Testament reality would be a gross mistake. They serve simply as a type for which the death of God's perfect son is the typological fulfillment. In the same way, the execution of sinners, whether on an individual, national, or even cataclysmic scale, certainly serves as a type, an example of the punishment that will befall the wicked on the day of final judgment. However, we should expect the latter, the anti-type, to transcend, to be qualitatively different from the type which it foreshadows. In other words, we should expect the judgment that God will mete out to sinners on the last day to surpass the mere temporal punishment, mere physical death that is handed out to sinners throughout human history. This being so, the logic employed in the standard Old Testament argument used by advocates of terminal punishment is somewhat misleading. Drawing parallels or inferences from Old Testament examples of future judgment does not constitute the slam dunk case which they suppose. While the Old Testament generally portrays the punishment of the wicked in terms of death or catastrophic destruction, some texts may seemingly imply more than this. In some instances, however, this is probably just metaphorical language. For example, Job's counselors paint some very graphic images of divine judgment. And some of this does sound very, very hellish. However, these counselors of Job are not really describing post-mortem suffering at all, but what the wicked may expect prior to or even in the throes of death, what Job is going through there and then, and what he can shortly expect. Nevertheless, this does raise significant questions, such as, when then will the wicked get their due desserts? given the fact that they so often escape any justice in this life. This is obviously a question that several Old Testament texts address, and they invariably project such punishment, that which will be meted out on the wicked, into the future. However, while some of this imagery is certainly adopted in the New Testament to describe the final destiny of the lost, the immediate context of these Old Testament texts generally suggests that their primary focus is on the eventual earthly demise of the wicked and or the circumstances that will lead to such. Unlike the prospect of the righteous with whom their destiny is often compared, the future of the wicked is certainly bleak. But it seems to equate more with sudden and ignominious destruction than with any notion of <laughs> eternal conscious punishment. Hints of the latter have often been inferred from two Old Testament texts in particular, namely Isaiah 66, 24 and Daniel 12, verse 2. Both these texts depict those who could be described as the unrighteous dead. Isaiah envisions their maggot-ridden, burning bodies, whereas Daniel speaks of them awakening to shame and everlasting contempt. The imagery in Isaiah is particularly significant since it lies behind the graphic image of hell, Gehenna, painted by Jesus in Mark's Gospel. Here in Isaiah, however, the prophet has been casting his gaze toward the eschatological renewal of creation, when the Lord will create new heavens and a new earth. Like its redeemed inhabitants, this renewed creation will endure before him. But while people will come from every tribe and nation to Zion in order to worship Yahweh, the scene is, as someone has put it, anything but soteriologically universalist. Rather, outside the city lie the dead bodies of those who had provoked God's anger and have consequently been exposed to his burning wrath. It's their maggot-ridden, smoldering corpses that confronts the visiting worshippers as they leave the city. The undying worms and the unquenchable fire 
will both carry out their divinely appointed task unceasingly. But it's not a picture of endless torment, but rather of enduring shame for those whose remains have been ignominiously dumped and treated as human garbage. What we have here is not an afterlife scene, but a figurative image of human carnage designed to evoke feelings of disgust and revulsion. However, while we must be aware of reading any New Testament teaching on hell back into this Old Testament text, we must be equally cautious about simply reducing the New Testament's portrayal of hell to nothing more than the grim reality depicted here in Isaiah. The same applies in the case of Daniel 12 and verse 2. As Bloch wisely cautions, like Isaiah 66, 24, Daniel 12, 2 must be interpreted primarily within its present context, rather than lifting it out and exploiting it as a proof text for a later, more developed eschatology. However, correctly determining the chronology at this point in the fourth vision of Daniel is very much debated. While the present scenario is apparently set at the time of the end, scholars disagree over what end this specifically refers to. Indeed, most assume that a second century author is still referring to events relating to the demise of Antiochus IV in the second century BC. Conservative evangelicals, however, generally see a transition in focus uh, to the eschatological last days. Either that transition takes place in chapter 1136 or 1140, but somewhere prior to chapter 12. In any case, as we've seen already, what we have here is arguably a partial rather than a universal resurrection. In the immediate context of chapter 11, many most likely refers on the one hand to those who have been martyred for their faith, and on the other to their enemies who have perished at the hands of God. Anyway, what is significant for us is the precise contra uh, contrast between their respective destinies. While both groups awake from their sleep in the dust of the earth, one group rises to everlasting life, whereas the other rises to shame and everlasting contempt. Given the parallel description thus far, many sleep in the dust of the earth, awake, we might have expected this last line to read, some to everlasting life, and some to everlasting death. However, instead the focus is on the revulsion and perpetual contempt de ra'on, which befalls them, just as in Isaiah 66 verse 24, which incidentally is the only other place in the Old Testament where this noun, contempt de ra'on, is actually used. Apparently these human maggots will be treated with the everlasting contempt they deserve although the text doesn't say by whom. Perhaps, however, it's the heavenly court or those who awake to everlasting life that is implied. But the fact that such revulsion is described as continuing for a very long time, olam, would appear to foreshadow something that the New Testament repeatedly says about the nature of hell. However, even Daniel 12 verse 2 stops short of eternal conscious punishment. For that concept, we must look beyond the confines of the Old Testament. And so we'll continue our search with a brief examination of the fate of the wicked in Second Temple Judaism. Second Temple Judaism seems to have exercised at least some influence on New Testament depictions of the fate of the wicked. This is hardly surprising. It's to be expected that New Testament conceptions of hell have been framed and conditioned by the thought forms of the milieu within which Jesus ministered. So, Perez. Of course, as Fudge rightly cautions, we must be aware of hastily equating similarity of language with agreement or even literary dependence. Moreover, it would be methodologically unsound to interpret the New Testament primarily from the perspective of contemporary Jewish thought. So, Ellis. Obviously, the inspired witness of the Old Testament is of primary importance. It's nevertheless important to consider how hell's portrayal in subsequent Jewish literature may inform our interpretation of related New Testament texts. Despite the impression given by some, the fate of the lost presented in Second Temple Judaism 
is far from uniform. Rather, expectations are diverse and are arguably in a state of flux. Some texts suggest the idea of annihilation or destruction, whereas others, sometimes within the very same book, are more akin to the traditional concept of hell as a place of conscious punishment. In some cases, however, the latter is not eternal. Rather, a period of conscious torment is followed by or will culminate in final extinction. So let's have a look at some books that envisage the prospect of destruction, and I mean just the prospect of destruction. In his dying words to his son, Tobit anticipates the times of fulfillment, when those who sincerely love God will rejoice, but those who commit sin and injustice will vanish from all the earth. The sharp contrast here with the joyous future of the righteous suggests that the wicked will simply be destroyed, although the immediate context does hold out the prospect of all the nations being converted to Judaism. In any case, both in this final chapter and elsewhere in the book, darkness and being destroyed, apolumai, are simply metaphors for death. Uh, the fate of destruction for the wicked refers plainly to death in the book of Sirach, Ecclesiasticus, as is brought out very clearly in chapter 19 and verse 2, death and decay will take possession of him. In keeping with this, fire is used as a metaphor for rapid destruction. An assembly of the wicked is like a bundle of tinder and their end is a blazing fire. Destroy the adversary and wipe out the enemy. Let survivors be consumed in the fiery wrath and may those who harm your people meet destruction. While for the most part, Sirach does not seem to envisage any form of post-mortem punishment, a hint of a different perspective is discerned by some in chapter 7, verse 17, where the Greek translation reads, the punishment of the ungodly is fire and the worm. The Hebrew text has simply an expectation of decay. For fudge, interestingly enough, this reflects a change in this period when the literature begins to speak of a fire which torments its victims but does not destroy them. However, it's doubtful that such a change is intended here, even though I want to agree with them on this point. Uh, elsewhere in the book, these images, i.e. fire and worms, is associated simply with death itself. So I think we need to be careful we don't read into these texts what we want to read into them, uh, or even what we don't want to read into them. Uh, the Wisdom of Solomon. As noted previously, the fates of the righteous and the wicked are sharply contrasted in the Wisdom of Solomon. However, the only pain or anguish the wicked are said to suffer appears to be prior to death. The unrighteous will see and will have contempt for them, but the Lord will laugh them to scorn. After this, they will become dishonored corpses and an outrage among the dead forever because he will dash them speechless to the ground and shake them from, their, from the foundations, they'll be left utterly dry and barren, and they will suffer anguish, and the memory of them will perish. Dreadful fear will seize them when they're confronted on the day of judgment with those that they have oppressed. But their eternal fate is depicted as irreversible extinction rather than ongoing existence. The hope of the ungodly is like thistledown carried by the wind and like light frost driven away by a storm. It is dispersed like smoke before the wind and it passes like the remembrance of a guest who stays but a day. But the righteous live forever and their reward is with the Lord. In the Psalms of Solomon, the eternal destruction that God will bring down on the arrogant is again unpacked in terms of extinction. The destruction of the sinner is forever, and he shall not be remembered when the righteous is visited. This is the portion of sinners forever, but they that fear the Lord shall rise to life eternal, and their life shall be in the light of the Lord, and shall come to an end no more. For the life of the righteous shall be forever, but sinners shall be taken away into destruction, and their memorial shall be found no more. Again, 
and sinners shall perish forever in the day of the Lord's judgment, when God visits the earth with his judgment. But they that fear the Lord shall find mercy therein, and shall live by the compassion of their God. But sinners shall perish forever. In contrast with the righteous who will inherit life and happiness, sinners can anticipate the inheritance of Hades, darkness and destruction. Perhaps the more terminal perspective in this book reflects the fact that the Lord's judgment is conceived in very this-worldly terms, implemented by human armies, albeit under the leadership of God's Messiah. The fate of the wicked in 1 Enoch is presented somewhat inconsistently, oscillating between extinction and continued pain. Some texts appear to speak of nothing other than death or destruction. For example, sinners shall be destroyed. By the sword, they shall be cut off together with the blasphemers in every place. And those who plan violence and those who commit blasphemy shall perish by the sword. All who walk in the paths of unrighteousness shall perish forever. But other texts speak of a fiery abyss in which people are incinerated. Yet there's no suggestion of any enduring pain or ongoing survival. And they, i.e. the heathen, shall be cast into the judgment of fire and shall perish in wrath and in grievous judgment forever. Their spirits shall be cast into the furnace of fire. Still, other texts, however, go beyond the prospect of mere death or destruction to portray a terrifying scene of conscious pain. In those days, they shall be led off to the abyss of fire and to the torment of the prison in which they shall be confined forever. And whoever shall be condemned and destroyed will from henceforth be bound together with them to the end of all generations. In the victory song at the end of the book of Judith, uh, Judith pronounces a woe over those who dare to rise up against her people. The fire and the worms of Isaiah 66 verse 24 are clearly being reinterpreted here as a depiction of unending torment. They do not refer here to external agents that consume or destroy their victim. Rather here they're depicted as coming into their flesh and causing pain that lasts forever. There's certainly no suggestion here of immediate or eventual annihilation. Rather, as Fudge rightly acknowledges, unmistakably, these words describe the traditionalist hell. For him, of course, this apocryphal book reflects a radically new departure from the inspired writings of the Old Testament, in which such a picture is entirely absent, especially Isaiah 66, 24. While Jubilees generally depicts the punishment of the wicked as perishing from the earth, this is not necessarily referring to eschatological judgment, but rather to one cried out on earth. You can read the text here yourselves. I'm just going to skip the text and you can read them on the screen. Uh, while in some places such a fate seems more clearly tied to, eschatological, uh, to an eschatological context, it again appears to be humans, Israel, rather than God, who is carrying out the sentence. However, there is one passage that seems to imply something a lot more sinister than death or simply perishing from the earth. Speaking to his two sons, Isaac offers the following words of warning. Know that from henceforth, everyone that devises evil against his brother shall fall into his hand and shall be rooted out of the land of the living and his seed shall be destroyed from under heaven. But on the day of turbulence and execration and indignation and anger, with flaming, devour, devouring fire, as he burnt Sodom, so likewise will he burn his land and the city and all that is his, and he shall be blotted out of the book of the discipline of the children of men, and not be recorded in the book of life, but in that which is appointed to destruction. And he shall depart into eternal execration, so that their condemnation may be always renewed in hate and in execration, and in wrath, and in torment, and in indignation, and in plagues, and in disease, forever. It doesn't sound very pleasant. <laughs> Clearly the first part of the warning concerns punishment that amounts to loss of life and descendants. However, the following verse 
clearly concerns eschatological punishment carried out by God that will involve being cut off eternally, eternal execration, as well as ongoing wrath, torment, indignation, plagues, and disease. For Fudge, while this may sound much like a description of the traditional hell, two considerations weigh against such an interpretation. First of all, this perspective, expressed only here in the book, would be at odds with the consistent approach taken elsewhere. Two, the imagery can be interpreted in terms of terminal judgment rather than enduring post-mortem existence. However, we need to recognize that this is the only passage in Jubilees that is clearly describing divine judgment that will fall on people at the last day. Moreover, while it may be possible to equate some of the imagery used here with the permanent loss of life and existence, trying to squeeze torment into this particular mold is rather difficult. Fudge attempts to resolve this problem by appealing to the fate of the Shechemites, as described in Jubilees 30, where they're said to have been slain in torments and under tortures. However, the latter clearly alludes to the pain that they were in due to circumcision, rather than, as Fudge seems to infer, execution involving some additional form of torture. Moreover, given the widely recognized dependence of Jubilees on one Enoch, it seems reasonable to conclude that the imagery of eschatological punishment in Jubilees 36 is depicting something very much like the traditional hell, as in 1 Enoch 10. Thus, rather than leaving us with an inconsistent picture, as Fudge would suggest, Jubilees 36 verse 10 offers a distinctive perspective because unlike other judgment texts in this book, it focuses on the eschatological judgment carried out by God rather than through human agency. In addition to those considered so far, there are also books from the latter part of the first century, uh, shortly before or after the destruction of the temple in AD 70, which are also relevant. But some of these may reflect some degree of Christian influence or reworking, whether in terms of additions or interpolations. As such, these are of lesser, lesser significance, and yet they still attest to concepts of hell that were clearly current when some New Testament books were being written, such as Revelation. For Ezra raises one of the questions that we've been considering this week, and I quote, whether after death, as soon as every one of us yields up the soul, we shall be kept in rest until those times come when God will renew the creation, or whether we shall be tormented at once. Ezra is assured, and I'm sure he was grateful for this, that he'll not be among such company, i.e. the company that's going to be tormented at once. But he's also assured that the unrighteous shall not enter into habitations, but shall immediately wander about in torments, always grieving and sad. But that's not the end of the story. As the earlier part of this chapter makes clear, after a fairly brief messianic reign, some 400 years, and seven days of primeval silence, the dead are raised for judgment to face the prospect of either the pit of torment and the furnace of Gehenna, or the place of rest and the paradise of delight. It transpires, however, that the torments of the wicked will not endure forever. Those who perish are now like a mist and are similar to a flame and smoke. They are set on fire and burn hotly and are extinguished. To Baruch envisages an eschatological resurrection of the righteous, but apparently only judgment for the wicked. The souls of the wicked, when they behold all these things, shall then waste away the more, for they shall know that their torment has come and their perdition has arrived. While such future torment is mentioned very frequently, in some places it seems to be almost synonymous with judgment itself, rather than a distinct aspect of such judgment. In two cases, however, it is associated with fire, or fire which is reserved for them, i.e. the wicked. Such fire seems to be closely associated with Gehenna, but it is unclear whether such eschatological fire continues to torment or simply destroys. In one passage, however, there is an intriguing suggestion that the shape of the wicked will be hideously changed, causing them to waste away even more and go away to be tormented. 
this is the type of thing that, that Dante uh, found very inspirational for the Divine Comedy. Uh, second, Enoch leaves us in little doubt that the wicked will endure conscious punishment in hell. Not only in the interim stage between death and final judgment, but also in the limitless judgment thereafter. In chapter 10, this book describes a very frightful place where black fire blazes up perpetually, a dark and gloomy torture chamber of extremities, burning fire here, freezing ice there, where dark and merciless angels carry out torture without pity. When Enoch recoils in horror, he's told that this terrifying place is what has been prepared as an eternal inheritance for those who sin rather than glorifying God. There's little doubt that such a passage stands behind some of the very graphic imagery in Dante's Inferno. Before facing torture and martyrdom, seven Jewish brothers warn Antiochus, their oppressor, about the divine justice that's in store for him. This is described in terms of everlasting torment by fire, endless torments, everlasting ruin, a fiercer and everlasting fire, and torments which will never let you go for all time. On the basis that great is the ordeal and peril of the soul that lies in wait in eternal torment for those who transgress the commandment of God, the brothers choose to fear God and have, and I quote, no fear of him who thinks he kills. Matthew 10, 28, probably alludes to that one. There is no doubt that the latter books stand closer to the graphic depictions of eschatological judgment in the New Testament, especially Revelation, than the other extra-biblical texts that we've been considering. At very least, this demonstrates that the traditional view of hell was clearly in vogue when some of the New Testament was being authored. So with this in mind, let's see now what the New Testament tells us about the fate of the wicked. Unlike the Old Testament, the New Testament has quite a lot to say about the eschatological fate of the wicked and the topic of hell. A range of terminology is used to describe it, along with fairly graphic imagery, particularly in the Synoptic Gospels and the Book of Revelation. One of the primary motifs is, of course, that of fire, which arguably derives from the concept of Gehenna, the, most, the, the term most commonly associated with the fate of the wicked in the Synoptic Gospels. Gehenna takes its name from the Valley of ben Hinnom, a notorious site where children were burned as sacrifices to idols. In response to this activity, Jeremiah prophesied that this place would be renamed the Valley of Slaughter, for God would destroy the idolaters in the Valley of Hinnom, and there would not be enough room to bury them all. As a result, corpses left to rot on the ground would be consumed by scavengers. Thus, this notorious valley conjures up two vivid images, being burned up in fire and being left to decompose. Not surprisingly, both images are explicitly linked to the concept of Gehenna in the Synoptic Gospels. Well, it has often been suggested that Jesus was also alluding to Jerusalem's rubbish tip, there's actually no evidence that this valley was ever used as such. Accordingly, we must be very careful not to read into the concept of Gehenna, a meaning that would have been totally foreign to Jesus and his original audience. To infer, as Tom Wright does, that Gehenna refers to nothing other than a municipal dump, even one that might metaphorically encompass the entire city of Jerusalem, is quite unwarranted. But how should we understand the graphic imagery associated with the concept of Gehenna? Is it merely referring to a dishonorable and contemptuous end, or is there some thought of conscious torment? Although the former might readily be inferred from the citation of Isaiah 66 verse 24 and Mark 9 verse 48, this leaves unexplained how Gehenna can be conceived as a fate worse than death. It would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. That speaks of death. Gehenna seems to speak of something worse than death. Moreover, the description of the fire in Mark 9.45 as unquenchable, as bestos, requires some elucidation. <clears throat> 
Why is the fire of Gehenna so described if those thrown into it are simply annihilated? The thought in Isaiah 66 verse 24 that the fire will not be extinguished so long as corpses remain to be burned up does not really seem to fit here in Mark 9. Since Gehenna refers here to the eschatological fate of the wicked, why must its fire be unquenchable? At the very least, this implies that those thrown into Gehenna are not destroyed instantly. The same inference can be drawn from the eternal fire mentioned in Matthew's parallel text, as well as from the additional reference to eternal fire in the final judgment scene of Matthew 25. Of course, there is major disagreement over the precise nuance of eternal, Ionios, here and in related texts. Does it refer to the duration of this raging fire or simply to its enduring effect? This is clearly a very significant issue for our topic to which we will return presently. For now, we simply note that eternal fire seems to correlate with the idea of unquenchable fire elsewhere. While not explicitly mentioning Gehenna, John the Baptist is almost certainly referring to the concept when he speaks of Jesus burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Likewise, Jesus is undoubtedly alluding to Gehenna in his parables of the weeds and the dragnet. Reading both parables to heart will be at the end of the age. Jesus speaks of the wicked being thrown into the blazing furnace, clearly another metaphor for hell. However, what is particularly significant here is the clause that immediately follows. Jesus speaks of this fiery furnace as a place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This familiar phrase is also found in several other contexts, sometimes in association with outer darkness, but consistently relating to the fate of the wicked. Weeping may simply denote terror or grief, A gnashing of teeth almost certainly denotes hostility or anger rather than anguish. Certainly that's how it's used in the Old Testament. Even so, both clearly suggest a conscious activity, which once again is difficult to square with any concept of hell as immediate annihilation. Conscious punishment might also be inferred from two texts in the Synoptic Gospels where the fate of the wicked is explicitly associated with torment. The first of these, Matthew 8, verse 29, relates the response of spirits or demons when faced with Jesus. Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time, they ask. Interestingly, in Luke's account, they beg Jesus not to command them to go into the abyss. There are possibly echoes here of the eschatology reflected in texts such as 1 Enoch. In those days, they shall be led off to the abyss of fire and to the torment and the prison in which they shall be confined forever. 1 Enoch 10, 13. Now, admittedly, we must be aware or beware of building a theology of hell on the testimony of two such unreliable witnesses, demons and one Enoch. (laughs) Nevertheless, Subsequently, in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus himself speaks of eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels, Matthew 25, 41. And the book of Revelation anticipates a time when Satan and his minions will be, and I quote, tormented day and night forever and ever. So to extrapolate the idea of conscious punishment from what is implied here in Matthew 8, verse 29, seems to have some validity. I'm going to skip over Luke chapter 16 because we've sort of dealt with that already. Uh, And it's really, I think, dealing with the intermediate state rather than the final state. Uh, While the fate of the wicked is occasionally depicted in less graphic imagery in the synoptics, such as destruction or exclusion, the dominant image is clearly that of an eschatological place which at least implicitly involves some measure of conscious punishment. What about John's gospel? With respect to the fate of the wicked, John's gospel has a notably different emphasis. Here there's no mention of Gehenna, Hades, outer darkness, a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, torment, 
or inextinguishable fire. The closest we get to the latter is the image of branches being cut off from the vine, being thrown into the fire and burned, John 15, verse 6. In John, the fate of the wicked is described in terms of wrath, death, perishing, condemnation or judgment, and most frequently and implicitly, exclusion from eternal life, the life of the age to come. There are no explicit references to hell in the book of Acts, although Peter clearly alludes to it when he says to Simon the magician, may your money perish with you, literally may your silver be with you into destruction. J.B. Phillips, I think, has to hell with you and your money, or something <laughs> along those lines. In the other two places in Acts where the fate of the impenitent is touched upon, Acts 3.23, Acts 13.41, the Old Testament is being directly cited. In each case, the penalty alluded to is death or destruction. Although Paul never mentions hell per se, he seems to associate the concept with overlapping ideas such as wrath, condemnation, death, perishing, destruction, being cursed, and separation from God's life-giving presence and power. And it's clearly possible to construct an argument for annihilation from all these ideas, especially given Paul's relative silence on concepts traditionally associated with hell, such as fire and torment. However, it's arguably important to understand everything else that Paul says about the eschatological fate of the wicked in the light of his most detailed description namely that found in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Here, Paul speaks of God paying back trouble on those who have afflicted his people. Significantly, as the immediate context makes clear, this word, thlipsis, requires conscious agony. For instance, elsewhere denotes the pains of a woman in labor, the troubles experienced by Joseph, and even the afflictions of Jesus himself. Thus, these people who have afflicted Christians with conscious agony will get a divine serve of the same. But is this, as some would suggest, something separate or distinct from the everlasting destruction that Paul goes on to speak of in verse 9? The fact that both the trouble and the everlasting destruction are apparently dished out simultaneously on the day of Christ's appearing, arguably implies that we should not separate these two concepts from one another. Rather than speaking of two distinct actions, surely Paul is referring to one and the same action, one and the same thing, the divine punishment that will be meted out on all those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Accordingly, it might seem problematic to insist that everlasting destruction must mean annihilation. How can the Thessalonians' tormentors experience the agony implied by Thalipsis if they are simultaneously annihilated? In any case, if the word destruction implies if, it, if it, the word destruction by itself implies annihilation, why is the qualifying term even necessary? If the conditionalist understanding of key terminology like uh, olethros is correct, everlasting destruction must surely be a somewhat strange tautology. Unlike the eternal judgment, the eternal redemption, and the eternal salvation with which this phrase is often compared, there's surely no need to highlight the unending result of an action such as annihilation. You're either annihilated or you're not annihilated. One might also conclude that the annihilationist interpretation seems to make the rest of the verse equally unnecessary. If they have just been annihilated forever, does Paul really need to add that they will be separated from God's presence and power? The fact that Paul must qualify in these ways the destruction or ruin that's in view here would suggest that, at the very least, this word by itself does not convey the meaning that annihilationists wish to infer. It's perhaps also significant that this is one of just two places where Paul associates fire with final judgment. The other is, of course, 1 Corinthians 3. 
Most translations, of course, relate the blazing fire to how Jesus will be revealed rather than with the ensuing judgment of the ungodly. However, as Fudge suggests, there are several echoes here of Isaiah 66, and these arguably suggest a twofold reference. That is, the blazing fire depicts the glorious appearance of Jesus, as well as serving as the instrument of God's vengeance, as it also does in the Isaiah text, Isaiah 66, 15 to 16, and verse 24. Such an image would certainly correlate Paul's depiction of eschatological judgment here with the dominant image of hell, i.e. Gehenna, in the synoptics. Moreover, it would also correspond with how the fate of the lost is portrayed in some of the general epistles and revelation. The general epistles include several references to the fate of the wicked. Not surprisingly, the references in Hebrews come in its familiar warning passages, text dealing with the danger of apostasy or falling away from the Christian faith. Hebrews 6 and verse 2 refers to eternal judgment as a foundational doctrine. And the sobering illustration that follows speaks of land producing thorns and thistles being in danger of being of ending up cursed and burned. While the cursing and the burning evidently applies to the unproductive land of the simile, it's clear from verse 9 that the warning is directed at those people who are described in verses 4 to 6. This eternal judgment is developed further in chapter 10, where it's depicted as truly terrifying, a raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Admittedly, the latter, in conjunction with the concept of destruction at the end of the chapter, can be construed simply in terms of death. However, the author clearly thinks of this future judgment as being much more severe than death the punishment handed out to those who rejected the law of Moses. So how can it be much more severe than death if it's simply death? But whether this alludes to enduring conscious punishment or to the complete destruction of body and soul in hell is, of course, the point of debate. And it probably can't be resolved on the basis of this text alone. The epistle of James includes the only explicit New Testament reference to Gehenna, outside the Gospels, James 3, verse 6. While James implies that hell is an inferno, he does not really elaborate on the concept per se. He seems to have in mind hell's destructive power, although there may be also a hint of eschatological judgment, as Bochum has argued. However, when James explicitly refers to eschatological judgment, it is in terms of death, destruction, and misery. And the latter, misery, seems to refer to the radical change of circumstances that awaits the wicked, rather than conveying the thought of eternal conscious torment. While 1 Peter makes only a passing allusion to the eschatological fate of the wicked, chapter 4, verse 17, 2 Peter is replete with references to such, depicted mainly in terms of destruction, and once as condemnation, crema. And I think it is crema this time. (laughs) But I didn't check. (laughs) Even though the historical fate of Sodom and Gomorrah is presented as the classic example of such catastrophic judgment, 2 Peter 2, verse 6, the two concepts must not simply be equated as identical as previously noted. Indeed, uniquely for the New Testament, Peter conceptualizes hell here as Tartarus, the only place, I think, in the New Testament where Tartarus is actually used. This was the Greek mythological subterranean domain where divine punishment was meted out on the particularly wicked. Accordingly, Peter depicts hell here as a gloomy dungeon, a place where rebellious angels are held in darkness, bound with everlasting chains, and kept for judgment until the last day. Likewise, God will hold the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. 2 Peter 2, verse 9. While blackest darkness is reserved for the false teachers of whom Peter speaks. Chapter 2, verse 17. In other words, Peter's depiction of Tartarus, like Jesus' depiction of Hades in Luke 16, seems to have very much in common with the traditional concept of hell. This is all the more so when we add into the mix what Jude has to say 
In addition to the emphases that we've just seen in 2 Peter, Jude describes eschatological punishment in terms of eternal fire. Once again, it remains debatable whether this fire is eternal in its character or eternal in its effects. Perhaps the closest the New Testament comes to answering this question is in the book of Revelation, to which we finally turn. Revelation contains the most graphic depictions of hell in all of Scripture. Although its teaching is clearly complicated by its symbolic and highly figurative language. But while we must beware of applying a literal hermeneutic to highly figurative judgment scenes, we need to tease out as far as possible what the author intends to convey through such imagery. In the first explicit reference to the eschatological fate of the wicked, Revelation 11, verse 18, John speaks in terms of destruction. Yet, as clear from the final line of this verse, such destruction does not necessarily entail annihilation. That is clearly not the intent of the clause, those who destroy the earth. Ruin it, yes, annihilate it. I think that's something we humans cannot do. The rest of the book suggests otherwise. Indeed, Fudge concedes that this destruction involves torment although he does so more on the basis of other New Testament texts rather than Revelation 11, verse 18, which he rightly points out stresses destruction rather than the accompanying torture. His words, not mine. Such torment is certainly evident in our next passage, probably the most important passage, Revelation 14, 9 to 11. Torment is possibly implied by the choking flames caused by the addition of sulfur to fire. It's certainly suggested by the use of the verb uh, uh, bazanizo, to harass or to torment, along with its cognate noun here. Here, any who may be tempted to succumb to worshipping the beast are faced with the terrifying prospect of unmitigated divine wrath. This is depicted as follows. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. The smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever, and there will be no rest day or night. However we read the imagery here, one thing is clear. There's not even a hint in the present text to suggest that these people will suffer only for a relatively brief time and finally be annihilated. Indeed, verse 11 implies the opposite. The smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. Even if this last phrase is not viewed as denoting eternity, but simply a long, indefinite time, it's a very emphatic way to express such a thought of perpetuity. The burning sulfur and the smoke are surely metaphorical, as is arguably the idea of physical torment. But the metaphors are clearly conveying the idea of agony without respite. It's a terrifying image, and surely it's intended to be a terrifying image. In chapters 19 and 20, a similar picture is presented. The beast, the false prophet, and the devil are thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur, where they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Once again, the point couldn't be made any more emphatically. Admittedly, the text is not referring to human beings here, but to symbolic images and to a spiritual being. And it's also true that humans who are closely associated with the beast and the false prophet in chapter 19, or with Satan in chapter 20, are not said to be thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, at least not immediately. Rather, they're simply killed and destroyed. Chapter 19, verse 21. Chapter 20, verse 9. Nevertheless, there's no doubt that they likewise end up in the lake of fire, since they must surely be included among the dead, great and small, who are judged in Revelation 20, verses 11 to 15. Indeed, as the following chapter underlines, the spiritual cowards, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who dabble in the occult, the idolaters, and all liars, they will all be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur, the horror that John equates with the second death, one that is clearly understood to be far more terrifying than the first. <clears throat> 
Therefore, there's no basis for concluding, as some do, that enduring conscious torment relates exclusively to the devil and his angels. Rather, Revelation concurs with the teaching of Jesus himself, Matthew 25, 41, 46. While certainly prepared for the devil and his angels, this eternal punishment will encompass reprobate humans as well. Thankfully, Revelation closes on a more positive note with a, a beautiful picture of New Jerusalem, the new paradise of God. And that's why I did this lecture and tomorrow's lecture the other way around. I wanted to end on a high, not a low. But significantly, even there, the wicked are not depicted as annihilated, but simply excluded. So then, what can we conclude about the eschatological fate of the wicked? In terms of the Old Testament, probably not a lot. Although eternal punishment is certainly foreshadowed in the earthly judgments we find recorded there, in particular the catastrophic judgment that fell on Sodom and Gomorrah, and from that and other divine judgments in the Old Testament, we can certainly infer that whatever eschatological punishment awaits the wicked, it will be absolutely just, absolutely deserved, as Genesis 18.25 makes clear in the context of the coming judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah, the judge of all the earth will indeed do what is right. But whether eschatological judgment extends beyond physical death and destruction is difficult to tell from the Old Testament alone. There may be a hint of it here or there, but it's certainly never spelt out with any degree of clarity. With the intertestamental literature, the issue of eschatological punishment comes into much sharper focus although the perspective, as we've seen, is rather mixed. In some cases, the fate of the wicked appears to be simply death or destruction. In other cases, sometimes even within the same book, the prospect is more like the traditional concept of hell. And in some texts, the punishment progresses from conscious torment to final annihilation. While conditionalists argue that the latter is also implied in the New Testament, such a chronological sequence must be read into the New Testament texts. It's never explicitly suggested. The language of death, ruin, and destruction is frequently employed. But as for the imagery of unquenchable fire, outer or blackest darkness, weeping and gnashing of teeth, and painful distress, this does not clearly refer to something that precedes the aforementioned destruction, despite what Fudge and others want to suggest. To press any of this imagery literally is arguably mistaken, but the thought it conveys is still absolutely terrifying, perhaps all the more so if the grim facts are left to our human imagination. As we all know from the best horror movies, it's often that, what we don't see, that's the most frightening. So is hell the ultimate holocaust? Not in any literal sense. That would involve selectively taking some of the biblical imagery at face value. Nor is this description appropriate in an analogical sense. That would obviously imply a place of unjust suffering and devilish torturers. Such is not how either hell or God is portrayed in scripture. Those kind of ideas come from the ancient world and from maybe Dante's Inferno, but not from the Bible. But what about the figurative sense? That is, understanding hell as the consuming fire of God that annihilates or destroys. As I think we've seen, while some texts might seem to support the idea of terminal punishment, others stubbornly suggest otherwise. Thank you, Paul. We have some time now for questions. So there will be some microphones coming around. If you can state your questions clearly and concisely, we'd appreciate that. And I'll try to repeat them so that Paul can answer. Hello, Paul. Hi. Um, in Jesus' um, uh, parable about the rich man and Lazarus, 
at that passage, Jesus clearly said that um, the suffering of fire and worms um, torment is during the time in, in the intermediate state before the final judgment. If the person, the wicked, already suffering after death before the final judgment, why do God have to rise up uh, the dead uh, to in resurrection and then put it put them into the lake of fire and burn in eternal fire again. Isn't, isn't that they are already suffering in uh, Haiti or something like that beforehand? The question is about the parable of uh, the rich man Lazarus and the suffering that's present there in what uh, Paul referred to as the intermediate state, whether or not final judgment and further torment is necessary if there's torment in the intermediate state. Uh, maybe I shouldn't have left out the, the bit on Luke 16 after all. Um, I think the main question that you're asking is what's the necessity of the resurrection for judgment if they're going to be in eternal torment in an intermediate state and then they're going to be in further eternal torment in the final state. Uh, so why judgment? I think the, the why judgment is really what I was addressing yesterday. Uh, it's to show uh, that these people fully deserve the judgment, the punishment that they're receiving. Uh, so that's why there's the, they're raised for judgment. But uh, I agree with the premise of your question, at least I think it's the premise of your question, there's not much difference between the interim fate of the wicked and the final state of the wicked. Uh, in other words, um, the rich man's experience in Hades in Luke 16, I don't think it's going to be that different from uh, the fate of the wicked in Gehenna, uh, the final state. So. Hi, Paul. Um, uh, you, you mentioned at the end about God's justice in hell, and you've also mentioned in previous lectures about the fact that you don't believe that there'll be, say, levels in heaven. Of, I wonder if you can comment. I'm thinking of a couple of passages in Luke where he talks about different levels of punishment. So, you know, those who have a greater knowledge will be beaten with more blows than those who don't. They'll be beaten with fewer blows and... I can think of other passages as well. Can you comment on that? The question is, will, th will there be varying levels of punishment for the wicked? Uh, on the basis of the text that you've just alluded to, I think the answer has to be yes. And I think you would also think just from the idea of justice, the idea has to be yes. Like, would, does Hitler and Pol Pot deserve greater punishment than uh, your next door neighbor who, um, just lives a, as best a life you can, but hasn't trusted in Jesus, uh, I think the answer is yes, they do deserve a greater punishment, and yes, they will get a greater punishment. What that's going to look like, I have no idea. Hi, Paul. Um, I was just wondering if you um, could describe a link between a theology of a hypothetical universal atonement and eschatological universalism, is there a link there, or are there tendencies between those two things? The question is about whether or not a hypothetical universalism and uh, universalism, there's differences there, or links. Okay. I can't leave that one until tomorrow, because I sort of feel that you're cheating. Uh, <laughs> I'll be addressing that issue tomorrow, so it might be more appropriate to ask that one tomorrow, uh, when I'm at least thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, thanks, Paul. Uh, can you help us with um, how we might make sense of an eternal judgment for a finite life of rebellion? Yep. So the question is, does the punishment match the crime? I think theologically this is the hardest question, uh, the big question for um, certainly, well, on the topic, and certainly for the traditionalist view of hell, uh, this is the hardest question, I think, to satisfactorily answer. Having said that, in a sense, the annihilationist has the same problem. Finite uh, sin, annihilated forever. So that there's, that's still infinite punishment, if you like. So annihilationism doesn't actually resolve that particular problem, but I acknowledge this is a particular theological problem that needs to have be thought about. I have thought about it. I'm not sure I've come up with a satisfactory answer. I'll give you the sort of the standard answers, um, but um, I'm not sure I'm totally happy with the standard answers. Um, 
uh, Aquinas' answer really would be, your sin is against an uh, infinite God. Sin against an infinite God deserves, warrants infinite punishment. Um, D.A. Carson, uh, I'm just mentioning him, I'm sure there's other, many others who do this, uh, he would argue that those who are punished in hell uh, deserve to be punished in hell forever because they keep on sinning forever. Uh, in other words, in hell they don't repent. I think I'm probably happier with that explanation, uh, but it still it raises, well, it raises some of the questions that we're going to be having to look at tomorrow, uh, but it does raise certain, like all these solutions raise their own set of problems as well. Uh, but um, yeah, I, I think that would be the answer I would give, uh, but uh, I'm still thinking about it. <laughs> Hi, Paul. Uh, thanks for today. Uh, the un unquenchable fire uh, has a, a temporal aspect, as you said, but uh, what place does unquenchable and never satisfied? So in, in Proverbs 30, a fire that is never satisfied, that never uh, says enough. What place does a satisfaction um, imagery come into the unquenchable fire? The question is about the relationship of temporality and satisfaction in the um, image of fire. I'm not sure I fully understand the question. Um, uh, satisfaction for whom? The fire. For the fire. Yeah. yeah, I'm still not. I'm still not. Maybe I'm just being too stupid, but I, I don't understand what the issue really is. Um, I guess I'd be thinking like when you put too much wood on a fire it goes out so it's in that like it's satisfied or kind of goes out because it's had too much whereas right. this is a fire that's saying i've never yeah uh give me more on more's uh yeah yeah well, so I, like, I think the traditionalist response would be that the that the those who find themselves in hell if if, if you want to use the fire language in a literal sense uh the fire doesn't go out because it's, it's like the burning bush uh the 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 fuel isn't burned up. Um, I don't know if that satisfies <laughs> your question or not. Hello. Um, if humans are punished eternally for sin, uh, what do you think it means that Jesus took our punishment? So if humans are punished eternally for sin, what does it mean that Jesus took our punishment? the relationship of Jesus' punishment on our behalf. Yeah. Um, I mentioned the, the other question there being one of the hardest things. This is probably the hardest thing. Um, uh, and I'm not sure I've got a satisfactory answer to this one. Um, uh, like Fudge uh, in his book has a chapter on this and I think um, it's quite a hard chapter to respond to. Uh, I'm not sure I've got a satisfactory answer to this one. Uh, so if Jesus, through his death on the cross, uh, atoned for human sin, uh, why do humans who aren't, I assume, aren't atoned for through the cross have to atone for their sins forever? Uh, that's really what your question is, isn't it? Um, again, it's not a, it's, a sort of, it's not a fully thought out answer, but Jesus is the uh, eternal son of God. Uh, and maybe uh, as such, uh, his death carries a lot more weight uh, than the rest of us. Uh, but again, there may be better answers than that, but that's, that's an issue I'm still wrestling with. Hi, Paul. Um, thank you for the lecture. Um, I appreciated you were very careful as we worked through the biblical material not to claim too much for any passage and, and, and more than what the text actually claimed. By the time we got to Revelation, we know who Jesus is. We've got a far fuller picture of some of these Old Testament images. Um, my question is, we as Christian preachers of the gospel, how do we then preach those undeveloped Old Testament motifs when we come to preaching Old Testament texts? The question is about uh, taking caution about saying too much from biblical texts. How do we faithfully preach those texts and develop doctrine, or is it appropriate to develop doctrine in those texts when we're preaching? Okay. Uh, number one, don't read the New Testament back into the Old Testament. That's a cardinal mistake. It's one that we can make very easily. I would say don't make that mistake. Try not to read your New Testament back into your Old Testament. But make sure you 
if there's a type, if there's an Old Testament passage that foreshadows something in the New Testament, draw that out. So that's how I would preach on it. Like I was preaching on those texts say in Daniel or in Isaiah. I, I'd try to explain what they're saying in the original context first and foremost. Uh, but then I would be thinking in terms of how does, what does this foreshadow in the New Testament uh, and work my way to that. It's like the, the Daniel 12 text that I take as a, uh, a partial resurrection. Like I think it's foreshadowing the full resur- resurrection of the last day, but I think it's a foreshadowing as opposed to this is a blow-by-blow blow account of, of the final resurrection. So that's, that's why I'd operate. I wouldn't, I'd try not to read my New Testament back into the Old Testament. I'd read my Old Testament in the light of the New Testament and draw out uh, passages that are foreshadowing uh, things in the New Testament. I hope that answers your question. Uh, hey, Paul. I'm uh, just wondering, in light of uh, hell as punishment, uh, some people looking at those images of exclusion say that God is simply removing his good life-giving presence. Uh, do you have any comments on whether hell is uh, the active punishment of God or simply the passive removal of his life? The question is about whether or not God is actively punishing uh, the wicked or if he is passively removing uh, his life presence from them. Yep. Uh, I suspect it's not uh, either or, but both aren't. Let's take one more question, or two more questions. We've got a question from the live stream, I think from a former student of yours, Paul. Um, Can you reconcile the idea of destruction of Sheol in alternative translations of Isaiah 26, 19 with the New Testament ideas? Is it that the destruction is ongoing? The question is about alternative translations of Isaiah, which was the passage, I'm sorry? Uh, Isaiah 26, 19. Isaiah 26, 19, and how we reconcile some of those readings with the New Testament readings. I think I'm brain dead at this stage, so uh, <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> Last question. We have one more. Hi, Paul. Thanks for your work today. I had a question based off a question from Chase actually the other day about how in the garden back in Eden, Adam and Eve had access to the tree of life. And so once that was cut off, uh, you mentioned that we were no longer eternal or had access to uh, being immortal. I was wondering what consequence this has for the permanent removal from the tree of life, as in you're not in heaven if you're in hell, and what, what if that feeds into the nature of the punishment that the reprobate will suffer. The question is about mortality versus immortality, especially for uh, the reprobate. Yeah, again, I think this is one of the stronger arguments that a terminalist can put forward. Um, I'm not saying you're a terminalist, I'm just saying I think it's one of their stronger arguments. Um, obviously, the, we'll say more about this tomorrow, but the image of heaven uh, we'll finish off with is, is this you know, tree of life. Uh, that's something that believers have access to, uh, conveying the idea that, that we're going to endure forever uh, in this happy place. Uh, unbelievers don't have access to that tree of life, therefore the annihilationists will say uh, they're raised uh, Well, the more evangelical ones will say they suffer for a while, but because they're not given access to the tree of life, because they don't, they're not raised with a immortal body the way that we are, uh, they'll peter out, they'll die. Uh, The traditionalist answer to that, I think, is that God must give the unbeliever too um, some degree of, uh, I was going to say immortality, but maybe that's the wrong word, but some some degree of uh, a body that will endure as opposed to a body that will waste out after however long they're going to be punished. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a good question. Can you please join with me in thanking Dr. Paul Williamson once again.